Chapter Two of The Road by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Holding Her Down. Barring accidents, a good hobo, with youth and agility, can hold down a train despite all the efforts of the train crew to ditch him, given, of course, nighttime as an essential condition. When such a hobo, under such conditions, makes up his mind that he is going to hold her down, either he does hold her down, or chance trips him up. There is no legitimate way, short of murder, whereby the train crew can ditch him. That train crews have not stopped short of murder is a current belief in the tramp world. Not having had that particular experience in my tramp days, I cannot vouch for it personally. But this I have heard of the bad roads. When a tramp has gone underneath, on the rods, and the train is in motion, there is apparently no way of dislodging him until the train stops. The tramp, snugly ensconced inside the track, with the four wheels and all the framework around him, has the cinch on the crew, or so he thinks, until some day he rides the rods on a bad road. A bad road is usually one on which a short time previously one or several trainmen have been killed by tramps. Heaven pity the tramp who is caught underneath on such a road, for caught he is, though the train be going sixty miles an hour. The shack, brakeman, takes a coupling pin and a length of bell cord to the platform in front of the truck in which the tramp is riding. The shack fastens the coupling pin to the bell cord, drops the former down between the platforms, and pays out the latter. The coupling pin strikes the ties between the rails, rebounds against the bottom of the car, and again strikes the ties. The shack plays it back and forth now to this side, now to the other, lets it out a bit and hauls it in a bit, giving his weapon opportunity for every variety of impact and rebound. Every blow of that flying coupling pin is freighted with death, and at sixty miles an hour it beats a veritable tattoo of death. The next day the remains of that tramp are gathered up along the right-of-way, and a line in the local paper mentions the unknown man, undoubtedly a tramp, assumably drunk, who had probably fallen asleep on the track. As a characteristic illustration of how a capable hobo can hold her down, I am minded to give the following experience. I was in Ottawa, bound west over the Canadian Pacific. Three thousand miles of that road stretched before me. It was the fall of the year, and I had to cross Manitoba and the Rocky Mountains. I could expect crimpy weather, and every moment of delay increased the frigid hardships of the journey. Furthermore, I was disgusted. The distance between Montreal and Ottawa is 120 miles. I ought to know, for I had just come over it and it had taken me six days. By mistake I had missed the main line and come over a small jerk with only two locals a day on it. And during these six days I had lived on dry crusts, and not enough of them begged from the French peasants. Furthermore, my disgust had been heightened by the one day I had spent in Ottawa trying to get an outfit of clothing for my long journey. Let me put it on record right here that Ottawa, with one exception, is the hardest town in the United States and Canada to beg clothes in. The one exception is Washington, D.C. The latter fair city is the limit. I spent two weeks there trying to beg a pair of shoes, and then had to go on to Jersey City before I got them. But to return to Ottawa. At eight sharp in the morning I started out after clothes. I worked energetically all day. I swear I walked forty miles. I interviewed the housewives of a thousand homes. I did not even knock off work for dinner. And at six in the afternoon, after ten hours of unremitting and depressing toil, I was still shy one shirt, while the pair of trousers I had managed to acquire was tight, and moreover, was showing all the signs of an early disintegration. At six I quit work and headed for the railroad yards, expecting to pick up something to eat on the way. But my hard luck was still with me. I was refused food at house after house. Then I got a handout. My spirits soared, for it was the largest handout I had ever seen in a long and varied experience. It was a parcel wrapped in newspapers and as big as a mature suitcase. I hurried to a vacant lot and opened it. First I saw cake, then more cake, all kinds and makes of cake, and then some. It was all cake. No bread and butter with thick firm slices of meat between. Nothing but cake. And I, who of all things, abhorred cake most. 
In another age and clime they sat down by the waters of Babylon and wept. And in a vacant lot in Canada's proud capital, I too sat down and wept, over a mountain of cake. As one looks upon the face of his dead son, so looked I upon this multitudinous pastry. I suppose I was an ungrateful tramp, for I refused to partake of the bounteousness of the house that had had a party the night before. Evidently the guests hadn't liked cake either. That cake marked the crisis in my fortunes. Then it nothing could be worse. Therefore things must begin to mend. And they did. At the very next house I was given a set-down. Now a set-down is the height of bliss. One is taken inside, very often is given a chance to wash, and is then set down at a table. Tramps love to show their legs under a table. The house was large and comfortable, in the midst of spacious grounds and fine trees, and sat well back from the street. They had just finished eating, and I was taken right into the dining room. In itself a most unusual happening, for the tramp who is lucky enough to win a set-down usually receives it in the kitchen. A grizzled and gracious Englishman, his matronly wife, and a beautiful young Frenchwoman talked with me while I ate. I wonder if that beautiful young Frenchwoman would remember at this late day the laugh I gave her when I uttered the barbaric phrase, two bits. You see, I was trying delicately to hit them for a light piece. That was how the sum of money came to be mentioned. What? she said. Two bits, said I. Her mouth was twitching, as she again said, What? Two bits, said I. Whereat she burst into laughter. Won't you repeat it? she said, when she had regained control of herself. Two bits, said I. And once more she rippled into uncontrollable silvery laughter. I beg your pardon, said she. But what, what was it you said? Two bits, said I. Is there anything wrong about it? Not that I know of, she gurgled between gasps. But what does it mean? I explained, but I do not remember now whether or not I got that two bits out of her. But I have often wondered since as to which of us was the provincial. When I arrived at the depot I found, much to my disgust, a bunch of at least twenty tramps that were waiting to ride out the blind baggages of the overland. Now two or three tramps on the blind baggage are all right. They are inconspicuous. But a score? That meant trouble. No train crew would ever let all of us ride. I may as well explain here what a blind baggage is. Some mail cars are built without doors in the ends. Hence, such a car is blind. The mail cars that possess end doors have those doors always locked. Suppose, after the train has started, that a tramp gets onto the platform of one of these blind cars. There is no door, or the door is locked. No conductor or brakeman can get to him to collect fare or throw him off. It is clear that the tramp is safe until the next time the train stops. Then he must get off, run ahead in the darkness, and when the train pulls by, jump on to the blind again. But there are ways and ways, as we shall see. When the train pulled out, those twenty tramps swarmed upon the three blinds. Some climbed on before the train had run a car length. They were awkward dubs, and I saw their speedy finish. Of course, the train crew was on, and at the first stop the trouble began. I jumped off and ran forward along the track. I noticed that I was accompanied by a number of the tramps. They evidently knew their business. When one is beating an overland, he must always keep well ahead of the train at the stops. I ran ahead, and as I ran, one by one, those that accompanied me dropped out. This dropping out was the measure of their skill and nerve in boarding a train. For this is the way it works. When the train starts, the shack rides out the blind. There is no way for him to get back into the train proper except by jumping off the blind and catching a platform where the car ends are not blind. When the train is going as fast as the shack cares to risk, he therefore jumps off the blind lets several cars go by, and gets on to the train. So it is up to the tramp to run so far ahead that before the blind is opposite him, the shack will have already vacated it. I dropped the last tramp by about fifty feet and waited. The train started. I saw the lantern of the shack on the first blind. He was riding her out, and I saw the dub stand forlornly by the track as the blind went by. They made no attempt to get on. They were beaten by their own inefficiency at the very start. 
After them, in the lineup, came the tramps that knew a little something about the game. They let the first blind, occupied by the shack, go by, and jumped on the second and third blinds. Of course, the shack jumped off the first and on to the second as it went by, and scrambled around there, throwing off the men who had boarded it. But the point is that I was so far ahead that when the first blind came opposite me, the shack had already left it and was tangled up with the tramps on the second blind. A half dozen of the more skillful tramps, who had run far enough ahead, made the first blind too. At the next stop, as we ran forward along the track, I counted but fifteen of us five had been ditched. The weeding out process had begun nobly, and it continued station by station. Now we were fourteen, now twelve, now eleven, now nine, now eight. It reminded me of the ten little niggers of the nursery rhyme. I was resolved that I should be the last little nigger of all. And why not? Was I not blessed with strength, agility, and youth? I was eighteen and in perfect condition. And didn't I have my nerve with me? And furthermore, was I not a tramp royal? Were not these other tramps mere dubs and gay cats and amateurs alongside of me? If I weren't the last little nigger, I might as well quit the game and get a job on an alfalfa farm somewhere. By the time our number had been reduced to four, the whole train crew had become interested. From then on it was a contest of skill and wits, with the odds in favor of the crew. One by one, the three other survivors turned up missing until I alone remained. My, but I was proud of myself. No Croesus was ever prouder of his first million. I was holding her down in spite of two brakemen, a conductor, a fireman, and an engineer. And here are a few samples of the way I held her down. Out ahead, in the darkness, so far ahead that the shack riding out the blind must perforce get off before it reaches me, I get on. Very well. I am good for another station. When that station is reached, I dart ahead again to repeat the maneuver. The train pulls out. I watch her coming. There is no light of a lantern on the blind. Has the crew abandoned the fight? I do not know. One never knows, and one must be prepared every moment for anything. As the first blind comes opposite me, and I run to leap aboard, I strain my eyes to see if the shack is on the platform. For all I know, he may be there with his lantern doused, and even as I spring upon the steps, that lantern may smash down upon my head. I ought to know. I have been hit by lanterns two or three times. But no, the first blind is empty. The train is gathering speed. I am safe for another station. But am I? I feel the train slacken speed. On the instant I am alert. A maneuver is being executed against me, and I do not know what it is. I try to watch on both sides at once, not forgetting to keep track of the tender in front of me. From any one or all of these three directions I may be assailed. Ah, there it comes. The shack has ridden out the engine. My first warning is when his feet strike the steps of the right-hand side of the blind. Like a flash I am off the blind to the left and running ahead past the engine. I lose myself in the darkness. The situation is where it has been ever since the train left Ottawa. I am ahead and the train must come past me if it is to proceed on its journey. I have as good a chance as ever for boarding her. I watch carefully. I see a lantern come forward to the engine, and I do not see it go back from the engine. It must therefore be still on the engine, and it is a fair assumption that attached to the handle of that lantern is a shack. That shack was lazy, or else he would have put out his lantern instead of trying to shield it as he came forward. The train pulls out. The first blind is empty, and I gain it. As before, the train slackens, the shack from the engine boards the blind from one side, and I go off the other side and run forward. As I wait in the darkness, I am conscious of a big thrill of pride. The overland has stopped twice for me. For me, a poor hobo on the bum. I alone have twice stopped the overland with its many passengers and coaches, its government mail, and its two thousand steam horses straining in the engine and I weigh only one hundred and sixty pounds, and I haven't a five-cent piece in my pocket. Again I see the lantern come forward to the engine, but this time it comes conspicuously, a bit too conspicuously to suit me, and I wonder what is up. At any rate, I have something else to be afraid of than the shack on the engine. The train pulls by. Just in time, before I make my spring, I see the dark form of a shack, without a lantern, on the first blind. 
I let it go by and prepare to board the second blind. But the shack on the first blind has jumped off and is at my heels. Also, I have a fleeting glimpse of the lantern of the shack who rode out the engine. He has jumped off, and now both shacks are on the ground on the same side with me. The next moment the second blind comes by and I am aboard it. But I do not linger. I have figured out my counter move. As I dash across the platform, I hear the impact of the shack's feet against the steps as he boards. I jump off the other side and run forward with the train. My plan is to run forward and get on the first blind. It is nip and tuck, for the train is gathering speed. Also, the shack is behind me and running after me. I guess I am the better sprinter, for I make the first blind. I stand on the steps and watch my pursuer. He is only about ten feet back and running hard but now the train has approximated his own speed, and relative to me, he is standing still. I encourage him, hold out my hand to him, but he explodes in a mighty oath, gives up, and makes the train several cars back. The train is speeding along, and I am still chuckling to myself, when, without warning, a spray of water strikes me. The fireman is playing the hose on me from the engine. I step forward from the car platform to the rear of the tender, where I am sheltered under the overhang. The water flies harmlessly over my head. My fingers itch to climb up on the tender and lamb that fireman with a chunk of coal. But I know if I do that, I'll be massacred by him and the engineer, and I refrain. At the next stop, I am off and ahead in the darkness. This time, when the train pulls out, both shacks are on the first blind. I divine their game. They have blocked the repetition of my previous play. I cannot again take the second blind, cross over, and run forward to the first. As soon as the first blind passes, and I do not get on, they swing off, one on each side of the train. I board the second blind, and as I do so, I know that a moment later, simultaneously, those two shacks will arrive on both sides of me. It is like a trap. Both ways are blocked, yet there is another way out, and that way is up. So I do not wait for my pursuers to arrive. I climb upon the upright ironwork of the platform, and stand upon the wheel of the handbrake. This has taken up the moment of grace, and I hear the shack strike the steps on either side. I don't stop to look. I raise my arms overhead until my hands rest against the down-curving ends of the roofs of the two cars. One hand, of course, is on the curved roof of one car, and the other hand on the curved roof of the other car. By this time, both shacks are coming up the steps. I know it, though I am too busy to see them. All this is happening in the space of only several seconds. I make a spring with my legs and muscle myself up with my arms. As I draw up my legs, both shacks reach for me and clutch empty air. I know this, for I look down and see them. Also, I hear them swear. I am now in a precarious position, riding the ends of the down-curving roofs of two cars at the same time. With a quick, tense movement, I transfer both legs to the curve of one roof and both hands to the curve of the other roof. Then gripping the edge of that curving roof, I climb over the curve to the level roof above, where I sit down to catch my breath, holding on the while to a ventilator that projects above the surface. I am on top of the train, on the decks, as the tramps call it, and this process I have described is by them called decking her. And let me say right here that only a young and vigorous tramp is able to deck a passenger train, and also that the young and vigorous tramp must have his nerve with him as well. The train goes on gathering speed, and I know I am safe until the next stop, but only until the next stop. If I remain on the roof after the train stops, I know those shacks will fusillade me with rocks. A healthy shack can do drop a pretty heavy chunk of stone on top of a car, say anywhere from 5 to 20 pounds. On the other hand, the chances are large that at the next stop the shacks will be waiting for me to descend at the place I climbed up. It is up to me to climb down at some other platform. Registering a fervent hope that there are no tunnels in the next half mile, I rise to my feet and walk down the train half a dozen cars. And let me say that one must leave timidity behind him on such a passer. The roofs of passenger coaches are not made for midnight promenades. And if anyone thinks they are, let me advise him to try it. Just let him walk along the roof of a jolting, lurching car, with nothing to hold on to but the black and empty air, and when he comes to the down-curving end of the roof, all wet and slippery with dew, let him accelerate his speed so as to step across to the next roof, 
down curving and wet and slippery. Believe me, he will learn whether his heart is weak or his head is giddy. As the train slows down for a stop, half a dozen platforms from where I had decked her, I come down. No one is on the platform. When the train comes to a standstill, I slip off to the ground. Ahead and between me and the engine are two moving lanterns. The shacks are looking for me on the roofs of the cars. I note that the car beside which I am standing is a four-wheeler, by which is meant that it has only four wheels to each track. When you go underneath on the rods, be sure to avoid the six-wheelers. They lead to disasters. I duck under the train and make for the rods, and I can tell you I am mighty glad that the train is standing still. It is the first time I have ever gone underneath on the Canadian Pacific, and the internal arrangements are new to me. I try to crawl over the top of the truck, between the truck and the bottom of the car, but the space is not large enough for me to squeeze through. This is new to me. Down in the United States, I am accustomed to going underneath on rapidly moving trains, seizing a gunnel and swinging my feet under to the brake beam, and from there crawling over the top of the truck and down inside the truck to a seat on the cross rod. Feeling with my hands in the darkness, I learn that there is room between the brake drum and the ground. It is a tight squeeze. I have to lie flat and worm my way through. Once inside the truck, I take my seat on the rod and wonder what the shacks are thinking has become of me. The train gets under way. They have given me up at last. But have they? At the very next stop, I see a lantern thrust under the next truck to mine at the other end of the car. They are searching the rods for me. I must make my getaway pretty lively. I crawl on my stomach under the brake beam. They see me and run for me, but I crawl on hands and knees across the rail on the opposite side and gain my feet. Then away I go for the head of the train. I run past the engine and hide in the sheltering darkness. It is the same old situation. I am ahead of the train, and the train must go past me. The train pulls out. There is a lantern on the first blind. I lie low and see the peering shack go by. But there is also a lantern on the second blind. That shack spots me and calls to the shack who has just gone past on the first blind. Both jump off. Never mind, I'll take the third blind and deck her. But heavens, there is a lantern on the third blind, too. It is the conductor. I let it go by. At any rate, I have now the full train crew in front of me. I turn and run back in the opposite direction to what the train is going. I look over my shoulder. All three lanterns are on the ground and wobbling along in pursuit. I sprint. Half the train has gone by, and it is moving quite fast when I spring aboard. I know that the two shacks and the conductor will arrive like ravening wolves in about two seconds. I spring upon the wheel of the handbrake, get my hands on the curved ends of the roofs, and muscle myself up to the decks, while my disappointed pursuers, clustering on the platform beneath like dogs that have treated a cat, howl curses up at me and say unsocial things about my ancestors. But what does that matter? It is five to one, including the engineer and fireman, and the majesty of the law and the might of a great corporation are behind them, and I am beating them out. I am too far down the train, and I run ahead over the roofs of the coaches until I am over the fifth or sixth platform from the engine. I peer down cautiously. A shack is on that platform. That he has caught sight of me, I know from the way he makes a swift sneak inside the car, and I know also that he is waiting inside the door, all ready to pounce out on me when I climb down. But I make believe that I don't know, and I remain there to encourage him in his error. I do not see him, yet I know that he opens the door once and peeps up to assure himself that I am still there. The train slows down for a station. I dangle my legs down in a tentative way. The train stops. My legs are still dangling. I hear the door unlatch softly. He is all ready for me. Suddenly I spring up and run forward over the roof. This is right over his head, where he lurks inside the door. The train is standing still. The night is quiet, and I take care to make plenty of noise on the metal roof with my feet. I don't know, but my assumption is that he is now running forward to catch me as I descend at the next platform. But I don't descend there. Halfway along the roof of the coach, I turn, retrace my way softly and quickly to the platform both the shack and I have just abandoned. The coast is clear. I descend to the ground on the off side of the train and hide in the darkness. Not a soul has seen me.
I go over to the fence at the edge of the right-of-way and watch. Aha! What's that? I see a lantern on top of the train moving along from front to rear. They think I haven't come down, and they are searching the roofs for me. And better than that, on the ground on each side of the train, moving abreast with the lantern on top, are two other lanterns. It is a rabbit drive, and I am the rabbit. When the shack on top flushes me, the ones on each side will nab me. I roll a cigarette and watch the procession go by. Once past me, I am safe to proceed to the front of the train. She pulls out, and I make the front blind without opposition. But before she is fully under way, and just as I am lighting my cigarette, I am aware that the fireman has climbed over the coal to the back of the tender and is looking down at me. I am filled with apprehension. From his position, he can mash me to a jelly with lumps of coal. Instead of which, he addresses me, and I note with relief the admiration in his voice. You son of a gun, is what he says. It is a high compliment, and I thrill as a schoolboy thrills on receiving a reward of merit. Say, I call up to him, don't you play the hose on me any more. All right, he answers, and goes back to his work. I have made friends with the engine, but the shacks are still looking for me. At the next stop, the shacks ride out all three blinds, and as before, I let them go by and deck in the middle of the train. The crew is on its metal by now, and the train stops. The shacks are going to ditch me or know the reason why. Three times the mighty overland stops for me at that station, and each time I elude the shacks and make the docks. But it is hopeless, for they have finally come to an understanding of the situation. I have taught them that they cannot guard the train from me. They must do something else. And they do it. When the train stops that last time, they take after me hot-footed. Ah, I see their game. They are trying to run me down. At first, they herd me back toward the rear of the train. I know my peril. Once to the rear of the train, it will pull out with me left behind. I double and twist and turn, dodge through my pursuers, and gain the front of the train. One shack still hangs on after me. All right, I'll give him the run of his life, for my wind is good. I run straight ahead along the track. It doesn't matter. If he chases me ten miles, he'll nevertheless have to catch the train, and I can board her at any speed that he can. So I run on, keeping just comfortably ahead of him, and straining my eyes in the gloom for cattle guards and switches that may bring me to grief. Alas, I strain my eyes too far ahead, and trip over something just under my feet. I know not what, some little thing, and go down to earth in a long stumbling fall. The next moment I am on my feet, but the shack has me by the collar. I do not struggle. I am busy with breathing deeply and with sizing him up. He is narrow-shouldered, and I have at least thirty pounds the better of him in weight. Besides, he is just as tired as I am, and if he tries to slug me, I'll teach him a few things. But he doesn't try to slug me, and that problem is settled. Instead, he starts to lead me back toward the train, and another possible problem arises. I see the lanterns of the conductor and the other shack. We are approaching them. Not for nothing have I made the acquaintance of the New York police. Not for nothing, in boxcars, by water tanks, and in prison cells, have I listened to bloody tales of manhandling. What if these three men are about to manhandle me? Heaven knows I have given them provocation enough. I think quickly. We are drawing nearer and nearer to the other two trainmen. I line up the stomach and the jaw of my captor, and plan the right and left I'll give him at the first sign of trouble. Pshaw! I know another trick I'd like to work on him, and I almost regret that I did not do it at the moment I was captured. I can make him sick, what of his clutch on my collar. His fingers, tight gripping, are buried inside my collar. My coat is tightly buttoned. Did you ever see a tourniquet? Well, this is one. All I have to do is to duck my head under his arm and begin to twist. I must twist rapidly, very rapidly. I know how to do it, twisting in a violent, jerky way, ducking my head under his arm with each revolution. Before he knows it, those detaining fingers of his will be detained. He will be unable to withdraw them. It is a powerful leverage. Twenty seconds after I have started revolving, the blood will be bursting out of his finger ends, the delicate tendons will be rupturing, and all the muscles and nerves will be mashing and crushing together in a shrieking mass. Try it sometime when somebody has you by the collar. 
but be quick, quick as lightning. Also, be sure to hug yourself while you are revolving. Hug your face with your left arm and your abdomen with your right. You see, the other fellow might try to stop you with a punch from his free arm. It would be a good idea, too, to revolve away from that free arm rather than toward it. A punch going is never so bad as a punch coming. That shack will never know how near he was to being made very, very sick. All that saves him is that it is not in their plan to manhandle me. When we draw near enough, he calls out that he has me, and they signal the train to come on. The engine passes us, and the three blinds. After that, the conductor and the other shack swing aboard. But still, my captor holds on to me. I see the plan. He is going to hold me until the rear of the train goes by. Then he will hop on, and I shall be left behind, ditched. But the train has pulled out fast, the engineer trying to make up for lost time. Also, it is a long train. It is going very lively, and I know the shack is measuring its speed with apprehension. Think you can make it? I query innocently. He releases my collar, makes a quick run, and swings aboard. A number of coaches are yet to pass by. He knows it, and remains on the steps, his head poked out and watching me. In that moment, my next move comes to me. I'll make the last platform. I know she's going fast and faster, but I'll only get a roll in the dirt if I fail, and the optimism of youth is mine. I do not give myself away. I stand with a dejected droop of shoulder, advertising that I have abandoned hope. But at the same time, I am feeling with my feet the good gravel. It is perfect footing. Also, I am watching the poked-out head of the shack. I see it withdrawn. He is confident that the train is going too fast for me ever to make it. And the train is going fast, faster than any train I have ever tackled. As the last coach comes by, I sprint in the same direction with it. It is a swift, short sprint. I cannot hope to equal the speed of the train, but I can reduce the difference of our speed to the minimum, and hence reduce the shock of impact when I leap on board. In the fleeting instant of darkness, I do not see the iron handrail of the last platform, nor is there time for me to locate it. I reach for where I think it ought to be, and at the same instant my feet leave the ground. It is all in the toss. The next moment I may be rolling in the gravel with broken ribs or arms or head. But my fingers grip the handhold. There is a jerk on my arms that slightly pivots my body, and my feet land on the steps with sharp violence. I sit down, feeling proud of myself. In all my hoboing, it is the best bit of train jumping I have done. I know that late at night one is always good for several stations on the last platform. But I do not care to trust myself at the rear of the train. At the first stop, I run forward on the off side of the train, past the Pullmans, and duck under and take a rod under a day coach. At the next stop, I run forward again and take another rod. I am now comparatively safe. The shacks think I am ditched, but the long day and the strenuous night are beginning to tell on me. Also, it is not so windy nor cold underneath, and I begin to doze. This will never do. Sleep on the rods spells death, so I crawl out at a station and go forward to the second blind. Here I can lie down and sleep, and here I do sleep. How long I do not know, for I am awakened by a lantern thrust into my face. The two shacks are staring at me. I scramble up on the defensive, wondering as to which one is going to make the first pass at me. But slugging is far from their minds. I thought you was ditched, says the shack who had held me by the collar. If you hadn't let go of me when you did, you'd have been ditched along with me, I answer. How's that? he asks. I'd have gone into a clinch with you, that's all, is my reply. They hold a consultation, and their verdict is summed up in... Well, I guess you can ride, Bo. There's no use trying to keep you off. And they go away and leave me in peace to the end of their division. I have given the foregoing as a sample of what holding her down means. Of course, I have selected a fortunate night out of my experiences, and said nothing of the nights, and many of them, when I was tripped up by accident and ditched. In conclusion, I want to tell of what happened when I reached the end of the division. On single track, transcontinental lines, the freight trains wait at the divisions and follow out after the passenger trains. When the division was reached, I left my train and looked for the freight that would pull out behind it. I found the freight, 
made up on a side track and waiting. I climbed into a box car half full of coal and lay down. In no time I was asleep. I was awakened by the sliding open of the door. Day was just dawning, cold and gray, and the freight had not yet started. A con, conductor, was poking his head inside the door. Get out of that, you blankety blank blank, he roared at me. I got, and outside I watched him go down the line inspecting every car in the train. When he got out of sight, I thought to myself that he would never think I'd have the nerve to climb back into the very car out of which he had fired me. So back I climbed and laid down again. Now that con's mental processes must have been paralleling mine, for he reasoned that it was the very thing I would do. For back he came and fired me out. Now surely, I reasoned, he will never dream that I'd do it a third time. Back I went into the very same car. But I decided to make sure. Only one side door could be opened. The other side door was nailed up. Beginning at the top of the coal, I dug a hole alongside of that door and lay down in it. I heard the other door open. The con climbed up and looked in over the top of the coal. He couldn't see me. He called to me to get out. I tried to fool him by remaining quiet. But when he began tossing chunks of coal into the hole on top of me, I gave up and for the third time was fired out. Also, he informed me in warm terms of what would happen to me if he caught me in there again. I changed my tactics. When a man is paralleling your mental processes, ditch him. Abruptly break off your line of reasoning and go off on a new line. This I did. I hid between some cars on an adjacent sidetrack and watched. Sure enough, that con came back again to the car. He opened the door, he climbed up, he called, he threw coal into the hole I had made. He even crawled over the coal and looked into the hole. That satisfied him. Five minutes later, the freight was pulling out and he was not in sight. I ran alongside the car, pulled the door open and climbed in. He never looked for me again and I rode that coal car precisely 1,022 miles, sleeping most of the time and getting out at divisions, where the freights always stop for an hour or so to beg my food. And at the end of the 1,022 miles, I lost that car through a happy incident. I got a set-down, and the tramp doesn't live who won't miss a train for a set-down any time. End of chapter 2